talk to you about breaking the cycle of resentment. I don't know who this is for, but uh, maybe it's for all of us. Chapter 18, 1 Samuel came to pass when he had made an end of speaking unto Saul that the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And Saul took him that day and would let him go no more home to his father's house. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul, and Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was upon him and gave it to David in his garments, even to his sword and to his bow and to his girdle. And David went out whithersoever Saul sent him and behaved himself wisely, and Saul set him over the men of war, and he was accepted in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. And it came to pass as they came when David was returned from the slaughter of the Philistine that the women came out of the cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tabrets, with joy and with instruments of music. And the women answered one another as they played and said, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. And Saul was very wroth and the saying displeased him and he said, They have ascribed unto David ten thousand, and to me they have ascribed but thousands. And what can he have more but the kingdom? And Saul eyed David from that day and forward. Father, we pray that you will use this to minister to our spirit at a very deep level. May each of us receive just what we need out of this passage. Father, take the word off the printed page, put it on our heart. May we find ourselves kneeling before you and saying, yes, Jesus. In all of life, in your name we pray, amen. amen. I have never looked at myself as above average. I've always uh, pretty much below average. I learned early on in life, there was always somebody bigger than me. <laughs> there was always somebody stronger than me. There was always somebody smarter than me. I remember sitting in first grade crying because I didn't understand what the assignment was and everybody else was working on it and I didn't have a clue what we were doing. I, I caught on real quick. When I got my driver's license, I found out there was always somebody out there that was faster than me. <laughs> if it was a kid, I went two streets over, there was always somebody richer than us. Everybody on our street, was they, we were all poor the same. Two streets over, they were richer than us. I, I, you know, uh, I just realized that's life. And I went on with life, and I never looked back. I mean, it, that's just life. It's not fair. It, some people are smarter. Some people are more gifted. Some people are more talented. Some people have more. Some people have less. It doesn't matter. We live in a culture where they're trying to make everybody has the same outcome, and, and nobody is having to do without anything. And uh, Christians learn we make the most of what God gives us. Okay? Can we just say that? We can just make the most of what God gives us. I'm not slighted. I'm not a victim. I'm just a child of God. And He gives us grace for whatever we go through. We all go through times where we hurt or we are disappointed or we are offended and there's no sin to be hurt and it's no sin to be offended. Jesus was, yet without sin. Learning how to live in a world where you're slighted, I think is a mark of maturity. When you can kind of meander through life and you just don't feel like you've been tossed to the wolves, when you may be, but you can go through life with a smile and your eyes on Jesus. I think that is a real clear-cut sign of maturity, walking with God. So I want to talk to you about resentment. Resentment, they say, is that deep-seated feeling of hurt and anger and sometimes rage because you feel like you've been slighted or passed over or offended. Some way, somehow. 
Some have likened resentment to cancer. It's that silent killer. And if it's not dealt with early, it can, it can just sap all the life you've got. Take it out of you. Proverbs 14.30 refers to it as rottenness of the bones. That's serious business, folks. There's an old fable that Satan's agents were failing in their attempts to draw a holy man into sin, and they weren't having any success with the guy. He was in the deserts of North Africa living as a hermit. He didn't have too many temptations. There, there's not a, lot, not a whole lot there to tempt him with. Satan is getting perplexed with his minions and their incompetence, and he finally said, the reason you have failed is that your methods are too crude for such a holy man as this. But he said, watch this. And he leaned down close to the holy man with great care and whispered into his ear, your brother has just made, been made bishop of Alexandria. And with that, the man had a scowl come across his face and his eyes closed and began to seethe with anger and resentment. Sometimes we just don't know how to deal with when somebody else is doing well. And we're not. And resentment can well up in our spirit. 1 Samuel 18 opens the files on the case of King Saul versus David and eventually it becomes King Saul versus God because Saul will find himself trying to derail what God is doing in David's life and he doesn't realize he's fighting against God. And the rest of the chapters you will find chapter after chapter, verse after verse, where Saul is being just miserable and he's making life miserable for everybody around him and he's losing. It's just a horrible story. His efforts to destroy David are really going against everything that God had, had planned for David's life. And Saul doesn't understand that. Chapter 17, if you go back one chapter, David takes on the giant Goliath and he instantly goes from a nobody to an overnight success. He is a national hero, and it happened in front of the whole Israeli army and King Saul and the Philistines, and everybody now knows David. His name is a household name. He is instant success. Chapter 18, King Saul's son, Jonathan, just finds David to be just an instant friend and something clicks between the two of them and we read in verse 4 that Jonathan stripped himself of his robe, his tunic, his sword, and his bow, his sash or his belt, and he hands it off to David. These are kingly, royal robes. He gives them to David. Everybody who saw Jonathan would have recognized him as a son of the king. And he hands it all off and gives it to David. Later in chapter 23, Jonathan will honestly admit he knows that God's plan for David is that he is to be the next king of Israel. And he said, I'm cool with that. You will be the king, not me. And without any resentment, without any rage, without any festering bitterness that, that it's not him, he willingly concedes that and says, I know what God's doing in your life. That is incredible. When he is heir to the throne and he has the willingness to say, God's doing something bigger than all of us. I get it. King Saul, though, is cut from a different cloth. This chapter explains two stories here. Jonathan is willing to just give it all up because he knows this is God's plan. King Saul is fighting against the plan of God, and he's going to lose this battle. They come back from the battle. The women are all gathered. There's this ticker tape parade. The soldiers are coming down the street. And all of a sudden, Saul hears the women singing David's accolades a whole lot louder than they are for him. And there's more applause and there's more congratulations for David than there is the king. And that doesn't bode well for a man like that whose ego is out of control anyway. And he absolutely can't handle the thought that anybody else is going to get more attention than him. 
Well, the rest of the story, it just plummets and, and his life just spirals simply because he cannot give God the green light to work in, in the kingdom or in his family or in his life. Verse 9 says, And saw I David from that day forning. In the NIV it says he had a jealous eye on David. Somebody has said that to harbor resentment in our heart is to prearrange our own funeral spiritually because we will just slowly die a slow death as we just try to cling to what we want instead of saying yes to God, Lord, your will be done, not mine. When we allow resentment to harbor in our heart, and probably if we were honest, we've all done it at one time or another, we begin to look at people different. We look at them as uh, competition instead of a blessing. We look at people as uh, they're a problem. Instead of saying, well, you know, God, God put them in my life for a reason, and, and I'm going to let that play out. No, people who harbor resentment tend to look at everybody a little different. David was an absolute asset to the kingdom and to King Saul. You couldn't have asked for a better guy to show up at, the, at this time in the nation when they were crying for leadership and there was no real leadership coming from Saul or his cabinet. Here steps onto the stage is David, who is a shepherd boy, and he's all instantly a success and popular in all of Israel. He's a household name. He's a blessing. And, and Saul can't even see that. He is blinded to all the benefits that could have been. All he can see is he's competition. And yet in this very hour, think about this. God is bringing David in, and what a what a combo to have both of them. If Saul is on the throne, and if he could just understand, I'm going to make David the commander-in-chief of all my armies, what could have been for the nation of Israel had Saul just been able to see that? In 2 Samuel 23, let me give you an example. David on a whim, this is years later, on a whim says, Oh, if I could just have a drink of water from the well of Bethlehem. On a whim, and three of his mighty men unknowingly sneak away, and Bethlehem at this point in time is held by the Philistines, and they will fight their way into the well and get a flask of water from that well and fight their way out and come and hand it off to David, meaning there was nothing that these men would not do for David. Think about that. David has got their allegiance, their, the army loved him, and he would have made the greatest commander-in-chief that Israel ever had. Later in time, he will. But at this point in time, Saul was blind to that. He doesn't understand that the whole army, the whole army would have just went anywhere. Let me give you another one. I mean, he, David was absolutely fearless. If you go back to when... Uh, David is trying to explain to King Saul prior to going to the battlefield with Goliath why he would be willing to take on a giant. Do you remember what he said? He said, your servant took on a lion and a bear. They come after the sheep and I was tending the sheep and uh, I took care of both of them. I went after them, I got my sheep back and I uh, dealt with the lion, I dealt with the bear, and this giant would be no different than those. But there is a verse here that just jumped out at me in chapter 17, verse 35. David says, I went after him, meaning the lion, and smote him and delivered it out of his mouth, meaning whatever he did, he, he hit it or whatever, and, and the lion let go of the lamb in order to turn and take care of David. And David said, and when he arose against me, I caught him by what? His beard. And smote him and slew him. Can you, now, now, how many times have you read that? David said, I took a lion by his beard. How many of you would be willing to grab a lion by his beard that's not in a cage? I took him by his beard and I killed him. You're talking about a man, young man, absolutely 
fearless, confident that God will be with him no matter what he takes on. I took on a lion and I took on a bear, not in his dreams, not in some video game. This is for real. What a blessing, and Saul can't see it because he's so blinded, so blinded by ambition and fear of competition of David. What else could he have but the kingdom? That happens a lot in our world. I've seen that. In the business world where some young guy comes in and, uh, well, it's not too long, he's shuffled along. Not because he's inept, not because he doesn't know what he's doing. I'll tell you why. It's because he's too good. He's too good. He's overqualified. And those above him fearing for their job shuffle him out the door because, well, we want to protect our jobs. I've seen that with new employees come in and they are more trained, they have more expertise, but the powers that be say, uh, 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 he needs to go someplace else, he's too overqualified. I've seen that in ministry where there's multiple staff, somebody comes in and, they're, and they, they can do a great job and those over them feel threatened because of their expertise and next thing you know they're someplace else simply because the powers that be say uh, they're better than we are. I remember in Ohio the DS and I went to see a guy full, other fellow pastor ask him about uh, he had just had special services and had a guy come in and preach and he made he made the comment and he said Ask how it went. And he said, well, I'll never have him preach at my church again. I said, why? And he said, he can preach better than I can. I thought he was joking. He was dead serious. Dead serious. He said, I'll never have him preach again. He can preach. He felt threatened by that. I thought to myself later, I thought, you know, I respected this guy, but all of a sudden I didn't anymore. Because I always thought, you know, as a pastor, anybody I bring in, I want them better than me. I want to bring in the best I can get. I want to help the congregation grow. It, I want the best. David was doing everything he could to help the kingdom, to help the nation, and to help Saul. He loved Jonathan. He's just doing what God told him to do. But Saul was looking at him different. Why? Resentment. Number two, harboring resentment will cause you to lose focus on God's will for your life. Look at this. From this point in Saul's life, there's a marked decline in his victories in the spirit realm. You'll never read another time going forward where he has victory, I mean real victory, over the enemy. He is forever concentrated on one thing, and that's getting rid of David. Chapter 18, verses 10 through 11, he throws a javelin at David, and by God's grace, he misses. Chapter 18, verse 21, he gives his daughter Michael to, to David, thinking that she will destroy him. Backfire, she, she loves David. Verse 25, he requires a blood dowry for the marriage of Michael, and, and David will double it, kills instead of 100 Philistines, he will kill 200. Chapter 19, verse 1, he orders his own son Jonathan to kill David, and he refuses. Chapter 19, verse 10, Saul again will throw a javelin at David and miss. Verse 11, he dispatches a regiment of soldiers to go out and search and find him and destroy David. They come back and they failed in the mission. Verse 25, chapter 19, he requires uh, David to be brought in before him and Michael refuses to hand him over, says he's sick, and in the meantime, she allows David to escape. Chapter 20, Saul turns against his own son because he sided with David. And in chapter 20, verse 33, he throws a javelin at his own son, trying to kill his own son. Chapter 22, verse 18, Saul has 85 priests massacred because they befriended David. Chapter 23, verse 24 through 26, Saul is no longer running a covert operation to eliminate David. But it's a full-blown operation that all of Israel was watching as he chases David and his men across the country, back and forth across the hillsides of Judea, trying to kill David. Let me remind you something. That is not why Saul was, was anointed to be king of Israel. That is not why Samuel 
pick him out and say, the Lord has called you. See, that's what resentment will do. It'll get you off course of where you're, what you're supposed to be doing. And next thing you know, resentment will just consume you to where that's all you can see. And whether you realize it or not, it will, it will absolutely consume your life. Number three, resentment will put a dark cloud on everybody around us. We may think that, well, that's just something hidden in our heart. That's just something that nobody knows about. That's our private world. Let me tell you something. It won't be private long. Eventually, it will leak out and everybody will know it. Because it will be seen. It will be known. Because that's what, who we are. It will identify us. Where that's all, that's all we are. Think of Saul's cabinet top officials, military leaders, who should have been meaning, doing meaningful work and doing good projects and things that benefit the nation. And all they have is two tasks. Everything's been cooked down to two tasks. Number one, find David, kill David. Nothing good is happening. All they're doing, think of the moral decay that just happened with the country when everybody around Saul, their whole job definition has been brought down to two things, find David and kill David. There's no great projects going on. There's no building projects. There's no, no social programs. All it is is get rid of the competition. I can't imagine the darkness that had to prevail over his reign. I can't. The morale of the military must have been an all-time low. And yet everybody in the military knew David is not our enemy. The Philistines are. The Egyptians are. The Syrians are. All David has ever done is try to benefit the country and help us on the battlefield. Some of them had fought with him, and they knew he was not their enemy. There's another thing that resentment will, will do, and that is that it will physically and mentally and emotionally and spiritually wipe you out. If we could go back in time, Saul, if you know your Bible, Saul was the most fit man in all of Israel. When, when Samuel went and anointed him, there was none like him. There was no equal that he had. He was fit as a fiddle. He was absolutely head taller than anybody in Israel, and he was a specimen of men. Get to the end of the story, and he's a washed up, empty shell of a man, there's nothing left of him. Simply because he was consumed in living life to his own way. And fighting against the plan of God. Let me tell you what, that's never a good idea to fight God. <laughs> My good friend Bobby Armstrong in Ohio, who was a Golden Gloves boxer, always used to say to me, Mark, your arms are too short to box with God. <laughs> I heard that over and over and over. There's a, there's a classic that I call classic book written by, written by Gordon MacDonald called Restoring the Passion of Your Life, Spiritual Life. I copied out a little two paragraphs I want to read to you that was in that, and he, and he relayed a story of his own life. Big in ministry, coming and going, people calling him all the time. I mean, he was in demand as a speaker. He's writing books. He's doing great things. Little, little did people know what lay between, below the surface in his life. Let me share this with you. He said, I think I know just a little bit about the meaning of hate. I would have denied it at the time, but looking back, I know now that sometimes I've been guilty for short periods of seriously feeling vengeance towards a person or two who I felt wronged me. At least that was my perception. On those occasions I was so overcome with adversarial feelings I never stopped to think that maybe I was wrong. And that's a serious error. One memory that burns deep within me is of a plane flight on which I was headed towards a meeting that would determine a major decision in my ministry. I knew that I was in desperate need of spiritual passion, and that would provide wisdom and submission to God's purposes. 
But passion was missing out of my life because I was steeped in resentment towards a colleague. For days I tried everything to rid myself of vindictive thoughts towards that person. But try as I might, I would wake up at night thinking of ways to subtly get back at him. I wanted to embarrass him for what he had done, to damage his credibility before his peers. My resentment was beginning to dominate me, and on that plane trip I came to the realization of how bad things really were in my heart. I could hardly pray. I couldn't even read the scriptures. I could not hardly think clearly about the future. As the plane entered into the landing pattern, I found myself crying silently to God for power to forgive and to experience liberation from a poisoned spirit. Suddenly it felt that there was an invisible knife cutting a hole in my chest, and I literally felt a thick substance oozing from within. Moments later, I felt as if I had been flushed out. I lost negative spiritual weight, the kind that I needed to lose. I had been set free. I fairly bounced off that plane and soon entered a meeting that did, in fact, change the whole direction of my life and ministry. But I have often wondered what would have happened to me if I'd gone on to that meeting with the hate and the toxic spirit still in my heart. Would I have not been exposed as the fraud I really was, and would not my life have been stalled out because of the feeling of resentment? What a moment of honesty. It's no sin to be hurt. We all get hurt. No sin to be disappointed. We all get disappointed. But what you and I do with that matters immensely. For God is watching. The example has been set before each one of us, and that is the example of Jesus standing before Pilate and how he managed and navigated those moments and how under intense pressure he was able to be godly in an ungodly moment when all the world was turned against him and hatred was being spewed out and it seemed like Satan was winning. He won, didn't he? Kept, he kept his eyes on Jesus. There's, there's a, an old hymn that says, there is a place of quiet rest near to the heart of God. A place where sin does not molest near to the heart of God. Folks, I don't have any answers other than you've got to get close to Jesus. And you've got to be willing to let it go. You can't hang on to Jesus and hang on to hurt. You can't do it. It won't work. You're going to be left hanging on to one of them. But I would encourage you to come to the cross and come to Christ and say, God help me. I don't know how to get rid of this. But I need to. And I don't know how to empty my heart. But I need to. And I don't know how to forgive. But I need to. Help me to let go of all that hurt. And give it to you. My friends, he can do that. I remember a dark moment in my life when I had been hurt deeply beyond I can't even explain it. And I remember laying in bed one night, tossing and turning, and I just begged God, I said, God, you're going to have to help me. You're going to have to help me let go because I don't know how to let go. And there came a piece to my heart and I felt the same way as him. I lost a lot of weight and it went right out of me and all oh, the peace and the joy that took its place. Folks, resentment will, will cause you to do a lot of things that you're going to have to repent for. The best thing to do is just give it to Jesus early. Give it to God. Let Him have it. He can wash you 
He can help you. He can restore you. He can give you grace for a world that just feels like they want to do it again. And He can help you face today and tomorrow and however many days you have. Jonathan got it. I'm going to walk with whatever God's doing. His father couldn't do it. And he fought it. And he lost that fight. And he died. And it says that the Spirit of God had departed from him. Don't go there. Don't ever go there. When, when there's something's rising up, you've got to give it to Jesus. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads. Now, I don't know. I don't know what I don't know. But God knows. And if you're here today and there's something in your past you've never, ever been able to let go of, I'm going to ask you to begin a journey with me. I'm going to ask you to trust God. I'm going to ask you to let go of all that hurt and give it to Jesus. Because He's the only one that can forgive and He's the only one that can set you free. There's not a program in the world. There's not a psychiatrist that can help. There is only the blood of Jesus. And I'm going to ask you to pray a prayer with me. And you may have to pray this for quite a while, but I'm going to ask you to begin this journey. And pray this, Dear Jesus, I need you. I don't like how I feel. I don't like the ugliness in my heart. And I want to give it to you. In the name of Jesus, take it from me. Help me to let it go for good. It's yours, Lord. Come and fill me with your Holy Spirit and wash that all out of my life. For I want to be clean, and I want to be right, and I want to be your child. And I give you all that hurt, and I let go. Vengeance is yours, Lord, not mine. I'm yours. Take from me all that hurt. I pray that in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you that there is a work deeper than the hurt that we feel. And I pray that, Lord, that you would continue the work that you've begun here in somebody's life and you set them free. Let them go out and live victoriously in Christ. And, Father, live to the joy that they were created for. Let them live a the plan that you have planned for them. Father, we come against Satan and all of his imps and pray in the name of Jesus that you will radically, radically bring joy and praise and peace to their heart. Where there was once emptiness and darkness, we pray that in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. God bless you for being here. Uh, it's a little different service, but it's what the Lord gave me for today. Now, I don't, I don't, I don't judge nobody. I judge myself. But whatever God's doing in your heart, let Him do it. Whatever you need to let go, let it go. Give it to God. Thank you for being here today. If there's somebody here that would like to pray, like to talk, like to share, like to unpack what's in their heart, I'm gonna, I'll just hang around. We'll take care of whatever needs to be taken care of. We'll do that in Jesus' name. I'm going to ask us to stand. I'm going to ask Wayne if he would be so gracious to close our service with prayer and then you all be dismissed. God bless you for being here. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you for being a God that understands what we go through. Lord, help us be with our nation. Watch over it, Lord. Help people to understand that you are the, our only 
only way through this mess we are in. Dear Lord, watch over us and take care of us. Give us safety on the roads. Be with our families, our grandchildren, and put a hedge of protection around them. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.